subscribe tag tv youtube channel and press the notification button hello and good evening today we are with my dear friend as well as senior international affairs correspondent for i24 news of israel and uh, israel and uae peace deal uh, is the hot topic of discussion throughout the world and i think it must be there uh, in israel so i will li like to ask some questions regarding the deal regarding the future prospects of peace and some more questions how's the climate in israel vis-a-vis -vis uae israel peace deal in Listen, political terms thrilled. and social terms Listen, people are thrilled. First thing to understand is, like in everywhere else in the world, the news here more or less dominated by the pandemic. And then all of a sudden, on a Thursday afternoon at around six o'clock local time in the afternoon, this just felt like it dropped out of nowhere <laughs> to the extent that most people were just disbelieving of it. Everyone saw the statement from the White House that came out first and then saw Donald Trump speak from the Oval Office heard the Benjamin Netanyahu was saying that he was going to be coming on TV later on. But everyone was looking very carefully what the Emiratis were saying, trying to see if this was really true, if this was spin. But the reality is that in the days since this has happened, not only have the Emiratis not lowered expectations in terms of what this means, they've raised them again and again. This looks like the real deal, a real normalization, a real peace with a really important country in the Arab world. And I think the Israeli public, and polls show, by the way, that the Israeli public is absolutely thrilled about this. All of the Israeli television stations, including ours, have reporters on the ground in Dubai and in the UAE, bringing back their reports, showing the city, showing the country, talking to the people, surveying the media, and people are really excited. And again, this is just looks like it's taking off. Again, time will tell exactly where this goes. There's every reason to be skeptical in the Middle East. We're all hardened skeptics, but it's pretty hard to be skeptical about what's happened in the last week. Uh, I spoke to, on telephone with some of my Arab friends, UAE Arab friends, and they were also optimistic regarding peace deal. They were optimistic about business, prosperity, and mutual trust. So uh, what your experience is that uh, what this peace deal will yield to well, well first, I wanna, first, I want to focus on the first part of what you said in terms of what your Arab friends told you. And frankly, what we're seeing from Emirati officials, from Emiratis themselves over and over and over again in the days since the announcement, of course, not just in the UAE, but in other parts of the region. Listen, Israelis trust is very, very hard to win uh, for people in the Arab world. Uh, this country has had bitter experiences with the Arab world uh, for its entire history and has two peace agreements with Egypt and Jordan, which have absolutely held as peace agreements. There has been no war against Egypt. There's been no war against Jordan. There have been diplomatic relations continuously with those countries. There have been open borders, but at the same time, they're known in Israel, as known as cold pieces, as a cold peace. There isn't a people to people dimension really in either of those relationships. There's not a lot of warmth. There's a lot of hostility in Egyptian and Jordanian public opinion. So Israelis don't really feel welcomed by those countries and frankly, for the most part, don't feel welcomed in those countries. And so to be able to win people's trust here is a very important but very hard thing to do. But the Emiratis have done everything right so far. And every single thing that they've said has generated a kind of warmth, a kind of sincerity, a kind of enthusiasm that I think has taken people here by surprise. And I think is really, at least to, to date, has won Israelis' hearts. Again, this is the Middle East. Uh, we can all be at least a little bit skeptical and hold that in our minds, but at the same time, every reason to be optimistic. In terms of where this peace goes, uh, Gulrez, listen, it goes wherever the Emiratis want to take it. And the sky really is the limit. And limit. again, to date, they show that they want to go up to that sky. And as long as that stays true, then again, the economic ties, the tourism ties, the ties in terms of transit, in terms of diplomatic relations, in terms of security, uh, these two countries have a lot to talk about, a lot to work together about. And especially if there's the kind of people to people dimension that's been missing from the relations. Of course, the relations didn't start on Thursday. These are relationships that go back a decade or more between the governments, but you're now seeing them open up much, much wider to the public level. 
And if that's the case, then again, these will be strong and durable relations that, of course, are going to help Israel, but are really, really going to help the UAE and potentially give the UAE significant leverage in this country and over Israeli policy. You are right, Owen. And um, the public-to-public -public relationship is the main type of relation. See, governments can forge their relations. They can break their relations. But people-to-people -people contact always remains. And I have seen one thing, that with Israel, uh, the closeness of hearts of Indians and Israelis is not because, just because of government. It is because of the so society. It is people-to-people -people contact. Similarly, I look at Russia. Uh, since the time of USSR, we were very close to USSR, but the same relations continued with Russia. The people-to-people -people contact between India and Russia is very strong. That is the reason you see, uh, even during this uh, time when we are having uh, problems on our border with China, Russia has say, even said that we will uh, deliver you weapons. We will try to deliver you weapons as far as soon as possible. So this is all because government to government is there, but public bonding is also there. The trust between people should be there. And I think UAE is the correct choice for that because look, it's a vibrant country and vibrant society. Except they accept everybody. So I think the people to people contact will be established much better than as compared to Jordan or as compared to Israel. Uh, sorry, Jordan or as compared to Egypt or even Turkey. Because there is no people-to-people -people content in UI, I am optimistic that you will be able to uh, engage with the society in particular. So I think it will be a win-win situation for both the countries. Yeah. Well, listen, let's put the Turkish case. There's so much in what you said, by the way, first of all. I'll put the Turkish case to the side because it's a bit of a, a different animal here. But as for Jordan and Egypt, first, I want to emphasize, I think the, from the Israeli perspective, Israelis would love people-to-people -people ties with those countries, would love to see a more welcoming approach to Israeli tourists at the grassroots level in those countries, and would love to have more of a people-to-people -people dimension in those relationships. It hasn't happened, and again, going back decades, I think, to Israeli sorrow, and the fact that it looks as if it is happening before our very eyes in the UAE just makes that so very promising. And the other thing, of course, you said that's very different about the UAE from Egypt and Jordan, and frankly, from the vast majority of countries around the world, is, is just how international and multicultural it is, just how cosmopolitan, absolutely, and just how many different nationalities, just how much of an entrepot it is. Yeah. And in some sense, it's an opener in, in a best case scenario, which again, is, is what at this point we're looking at. It's an opener for people, people to relations, not just between Israelis and Emiratis, but for Israelis and people from around the Arab and Muslim worlds, and of course, not just there. And so this is just an incredibly important strategic link and a real game changer for Israel in almost every way. And if this continues on this trajectory, this really, and I'm not exaggerating, could go down as one of the most important developments in Israel's history. Again, we don't know if it's going to get all the way there, if it's going to get to the finish line. But at this point, that's the direction in which you're headed. Again, an absolute best case scenario. So what do you think about the plan to annex the West Bank territories? Because uh, UAE is saying because of this deal, uh, things have been suspended. So well, is I it suspended get... forever? Or is it suspended yeah, I won't for get so much to my own. <laughs> I won't so much get into my own opinions about annexation. But listen, by, by all accounts, of all of the things that were in the statement that was issued Thursday, Thursday night local time here in Israel by those three governments, this was the most heavily negotiated part of it. What exactly were they going to say about this hot button issue of the annexation? And the solution, as you know, so often in negotiations, to let each side explain it the way it wants to. So the Emiratis and frankly, the United States also are explaining this as a kind, well, let's start from the Emiratis. They're expressing, they're explaining this as a quid pro quo. We gave the normalization and in return, the Israelis conceded on the annexation. It, Benjamin Netanyahu, as you know, is saying, no, 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 it's not true. I still plan on doing this. But the Americans asked me for a pause for a certain period of time. So these two things are completely unconnected. So there's the normalization on one hand, which they just gave to us because we're a strong and wonderful country. And on the other hand, we gave this annexation. We assented to this annexation pause because the U.S. asked for it. We also, on the third hand, have the American administration, the Trump administration coming out and now saying this is going to be paused for, quote, some time. That was Jared Kushner's phrasing yesterday. Again, they're not necessarily saying to the same degree the Emiratis are saying that this was a quid pro quo, but they're coming pretty close to that version of events. So just to sum up, you have three different countries having three different ways of explaining this, but it certainly looks like a trade-off. It looks as if the Emiratis are, are agreeing to the normalization, 
in exchange, maybe among other things, for this uh, decision to suspend the annexation. Uh, how is that playing in Israel? The first thing to understand about the annexation is it was in some ways always a solution in search of a problem, in the sense that there, there wasn't much of a foothold in Israeli public opinion for it. You would ask the Israeli public, what is the most important issue for you? 69%, 69% of the public in a poll a few months ago said the most important issue for them, the economic aspect of the pandemic, the economic crisis. Okay. 11%, the most important issue, the health aspect of the pandemic. How many said that annexation was the most important? 4%. I can even count the number of percentage Only. points on my finger. 4%. That's right. This was not an important issue to the broad Israeli public. In some sense, it didn't really have much of a constituency. And even the people it was supposed to benefit most, the settlers themselves were divided for other reasons. Right. Okay. They were divided okay. on this for other reasons. So, and obviously it was a very problematic issue from Israel's perspective for all sorts of other reasons, mostly in terms of foreign policy, but also in terms of security and law and economics and so forth. So as you might expect, I guess in retrospect, when you ask Israelis now, point blank, which would you rather have? Would you rather have the normalization with the UAE or would you rather have the annexation? Huge majorities of the, in the public say they'd rather have the normalizations. Interestingly enough, Golrez, including a huge majority of people who are on the right and on the center right. And they tell pollsters by a margin of 64% to 28% that they, right-wingers, right-wingers, would rather have the normalization than the annexation. That tells you, I think, all you need to know about where this issue stands in Israeli public opinion and exactly the kind of reception that it's gotten. And what's the reception by uh, parties like uh, that of uh, Libertman's party, or um, uh, the, what you call it, uh, that uh, party by of uh, orthodox people. I'm forgetting the name, orthodox parties. What's the, the what's their reaction to it? Right. I think you're referring to the Yamina party, which is a I mean, religious party, yeah, right wing. Party, exactly. Yamina, yes, yes, yes. Yamina. And it's hard to keep track of Israeli political parties, I think, for anybody outside the country. <laughs> and a lot of times, for those of us living here, too. Uh, you're right. It's a religious right wing party. Benutu and if there's party, any Yamina constituency party? for the annexation, it's there. What have they said? They have said two things. Number one, they say the fact that Netanyahu failed to deliver the annexation is a failure. And they are going to their constituents and their voters. And again, we may have elections here with that message as part of an election message. The other thing they're saying, and this is very important, they are welcoming this agreement. You won't, it is very, very hard to find an Israeli politician who has come out against this agreement including, or maybe even some sense, especially on the right, this is being welcomed pretty much across the political spectrum, certainly in the Jewish parties and the Zionist parties, across the political spectrum, including there, they'll say, on the one hand, we welcome the agreement. On the other hand, the fact that the annexation is not being delivered is a failure. <laughs> so there, that's there the politics. If you ask, right, if you ask them, which would you rather have, normalization or annexation? they probably wouldn't want to answer that question. The good news for the Yamina party specifically, and this deviates a little bit from our topic, but important when you talk about them is they're doing extremely well in the polls. They're set, if elections are called, were held tomorrow, to not only double, not only triple, but in some sense to quadruple their, their, no, the number of parliament Oof. seats that they hold, <laughs> the number of candidates they hold, but it has nothing to do with the, with the annexation or with the normalization or any of this, it has to do with the pandemic. They're running okay. on the pandemic, they're criticizing the government and the, frankly, the bad results that Israel's gotten both economically and in terms of health on the pandemic, that's their ticket. And in the longer term, that's going to, or even let's say the medium term, that's going to be probably a more important talking point for them than is any of this. Okay, 20% of your population uh, is made up of Arabs, Arab Muslims. Uh, what's their reaction? It's a really important question. And I was asking some people about this yesterday. What do we know about polling among Israeli Arabs? And their answer to me is we don't know much. And there haven't really been polls that have been released. I understand there's a poll that's going to be released in the next couple of days. But it's going to be very interesting to see some politicians from the largely Arab joint list have come out against the deal. Again, with the same, for the same reasons that Palestinians have come out against this deal. And of course, many, many Arab Israelis, if not most, see themselves as part of the larger Palestinian people. 
And so one wouldn't be surprised if they see this deal through that lens. On the other hand, you could imagine Israeli Arabs making a different case. Again, this opens up another Arab country to direct flights from Israel and direct connections, which one would think, again, it, it's awkward to speak in the name of Arab Israelis. I wouldn't want to do that. But imagining that, that might, they might consider that to be a benefit. We also have reports in Israeli media that the Emiratis are interested, in, and this wouldn't be a surprise, in investing in the Israeli Arab sector. They're going to be investing a lot of money in Israel. That everybody says. Uh, a lot of it's going to be in cybersecurity and in fintech and in other, mm -hmm. and in other areas. But there are reports they're going to be investing a lot in the Israeli Arab sector. And that makes good sense. There's a precedent for that. The Qataris have done that here and there over the years because of their ties with Israel. There's even a soccer stadium in an Israeli Arab town that's called Doha Stadium. So again, it, it would make sense for the Emiratis to do that. And one would imagine that that would benefit Arab Israelis. But I do think we should be a little careful not to get too far ahead of ourselves until we actually have pollsters who ask the Israeli Arab sector what they think and then tell us what the findings are. Owen, there are news that uh, even uh, Oman, Morocco, Sudan, they also want to recognize Israel and they want to have their own type of uh, peace deal. So how far uh, uh, do you think about it? And when we will have this great news that so many Muslim Arab countries are accepting and embracing Israel? Well, first of all, the news of the last hour or two, Gograz, and viewers watching this will know a lot more about this potentially than, than we do and be a lot smarter than we are, is that the Sudanese foreign ministry has come out and said that they want a peace deal with Israel. There's no reason to, to keep the hostility. As you can imagine, it didn't take long Great. for both Prime Minister Netanyahu and the foreign minister Gabi Ashkenazi to come out and welcome that. So watch all of this space. We'll see where that's going. I think what the Sudan example speaks to, and this is something that we've seen, and I may even want to ask you a question about this later, is that when you get normalization with the UAE, uh, this is a bride who comes in with her entire family. And the UAE <laughs> yes. has a whole, network, a whole network of allies around the region, a country as yeah. rich and as interested in foreign policy and projecting influence as the UAE is, has plenty of allies, especially since because of their connection with the Saudis, who in turn have a lot of allies. And so we very, very quickly after this announcement saw all of those allies, I think, basically step into line and praise the move. Again, a lot of them financially, politically dependent on the UAE. And, and they also have common cause with the UAE in terms of their own political vision or social vision. So there may be more to it than real politics. I don't know about all cases. And the Sudanese, I think, fit into that story. Again, this is a transitional government that has a civilian arm and a military arm. The military arm has very close ties with the Saudis and with the Emiratis. And so not surprising that they may want to make similar, align their foreign policy with UAE's foreign policy. Benjamin Netanyahu held a meeting uh, with the Sudanese leader uh, a few months ago or a year ago in Uganda uh, before the pandemic. So there have been contacts in the past. But listen, there's been a lot of talk that Bahrain might also be interested uh, in jumping on board pretty quickly. Uh, Morocco is a bit of a different case because they're not part of the UAE's alliance network, but also have historically close ties, not close, but historic ties with Israel and with the Jewish people. But listen, this is obviously a very, very exciting time to see those countries and potentially others decide to jump on board. Of course, the big one potentially is Saudi Arabia, a more complicated uh, decision for them, but we shouldn't rule it out. Jamin the uh, but, <laughs> Yeah, jewel in the crown. You're absolutely right. Although I, I wouldn't detract at all from the importance of the UAE itself. For all of the reasons that we've mentioned and that we've skirted around, the fact that it's a financial hub, a transit hub, a cosmopolitan hub, a very enticing tourist destination, uh, and a country that independently has a lot of wealth and a lot of power in terms of its foreign policy, makes it in and of itself a, a huge and important potential political partner for Israel. So there's no, if it were to end with the UAE, it would be extremely, extremely important for Israel. If it extends beyond the UAE, then the ramifications are, are just even more immense. Uh, I'm hopeful and I, I always maintain one thing that these Arab countries must be very friendly with Israel. And I'm sure that Israel will also reciprocate in the same manner. So I'm optimistic that one day, very soon, even Saudi Arabia will have peace deal with Israel and that will open all the gates. Uh, but uh, let me ask you one more thing. Uh, what about Al-Aqsa? Because it's also one big issue 
I just want, I don't know. Is it a, a holy site even for Jews like Muslims? It, it absolutely is. Or more precisely, and the geography actually is really important here, it's adjacent. It's part of a plaza, the remainder of the plaza of which is the holiest site in Judaism. Of course, it has the Dome of the Rock built on it right now. And it's also a holy, a holy site in Islam and is controlled in terms, certainly in terms of its day-to-day -day operations by what's known as the Muslim Waq. But yes, this is one of the most contested issues in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is exactly that piece of territory because it is so important for Jews. It's the site of the first and second Jewish temples. It is in Judaism, the holiest spot in the world, the place where God's presence rested and the only place where Jews are able to offer sacrifices when a temple is built on that site and to connect with God's presence. Uh, obviously, again, right now it's a, the Dome of the Rock is there and it's a Muslim holy site and under Israeli law, Jews are not allowed to pray there. That is the status quo there and Jews who pray there are arrested. And the day-to-day -day operation is controlled by the Muslim Waqif, but it's a very, very important issue in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I don't necessarily think it's an impossible issue to solve. Uh, there are other issues that are even more difficult. There are ways of finessing this, but we haven't gotten to a solution yet. It does play into this issue of normalization in an important way, because obviously one of the potential benefits for normalization with Israel for Emiratis is access to the site. And one yeah. of the problems with that is that the day to day, as I just mentioned, is controlled by this body called the Muslim Waqif, which is connected, certainly connected to the Palestinian public, if not connected in some way to the Palestinian leadership and or Jordanian leadership. And the question is, if an Emirati wants to come and visit Al-Aqsa, will they be allowed in and would they be welcomed if and when they're there? And the Waqif is saying no. And exactly how that would be resolved is, I think, an open question. I, obviously, if the Israeli military wants to use brute force to, add, to, to bring someone onto that platform, onto the plaza, I'm sure it could do it, but it would be extremely problematic or at least impose costs on Israel. So again, this is an issue that's going to play into the normalization. It's, it's very, very sensitive. The Palestinians, I think, have identified it as one point of leverage on these talks. They're looking for anything that they can get. Obviously, they're not winning in the bigger picture, but they're looking for what they can get. So in the issue in the in the Israeli Emirati, or maybe as we talk about Israeli wider Arab and Muslim normalization, this is an issue. Certainly in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, this is an issue. Uh, I don't think it's irresolvable, but it's certainly not easy to resolve. I'm optimistic that uh, Israel and uh, in the Arab states like UAE will definitely solve that issue also. And I wish it must be solved so that peace is permanent. We need permanent peace. Actually, what happens, uh, Owen, when we live in uh, uh, South Asia, we think that our uh, South uh, South Asian uh, subcont Indian subcontinent area, it is problematic because of presence of China, Pakistan, then Afghanistan in uh, near proximity. But we forget that there are many regions which are even more volatile, like Middle East is there, like Mediterranean is there. And compare this condition, our condition with Israel, Israel's condition is even more complicated. We always think that our, our, our region is complicated. No, I think Israel is more complicated, Middle East is more complicated, and Mediterranean is also complicated region in itself. You know, I think what you're what you're touching on in an interesting way is something that I've been thinking a lot about and did a report for our channel about yesterday, which is if you step back and look at this very, very wide region, stretching from the Ionian Sea and from Corfu on one end to the Andaman Islands on the other, you, you start to see a kind of alliance, or at least we could call it a network starting to take shape, especially through the normalization between Israel and the UAE, which is a kind of linchpin and a kind of focal point for all of this. But you start with Israel and the UAE. And one of the things bringing these two countries together is the need to counteract Iran and Turkey and Iran's proxies yeah. and Turkey's proxies. And then when you add to that the other countries who are interested in that loosely, you bring in the rest of the UAE's alliance network. You bring in the Saudis. You bring in the Egyptians to some degree. Then when you look at the issue of Turkey, you bring in the Greeks and the Cypriots and the Kurds. You think more widely about the United States. And if China signs its big blockbuster deal with Iran, 
you start to wonder if India in some way is part of this bigger picture network. I'm not saying that this is all going to shape up exactly the way I'm describing. We're obviously getting way ahead of ourselves. Uh, this normalization is five days old. Um, but I think at least thinking about this geopolitically really shows you what's going on and, and points to something that even if it's not fully realized, might be partially realized. And you start to see this shaping up and how this even could really involve India and in some sense knit these three regions together. Of course, as you also hinted at, Gulrez, importantly, against the backdrop of a potential US-China Cold War. This network would fit if we divide the world into puzzle pieces and in some sense one hopes that that's not the direction the world is going in, but is a possible scenario, then this fits within a larger US network and a larger pro-American network. Uh, again, I, I want to emphasize, this is a, an oversimplistic way of talking about something that's a lot more complicated. I'm fully aware of that. Getting way ahead of myself, we are. But I think that at least thinking about this is instructive for us to understand the issues that are that are definitely at stake. Uh, as per my knowledge and uh, my, as per my studies of geopolitics, I think this Arab-Israeli-American alliance will be a part of greater part of the Asia Pacific, which was called previously, now we call it in Indo Pacific region, and the geopolitics surrounding Indo Pacific region, right from the Horn of Africa to United States, India in between, Japan and Australia downwards, and definitely it will cover that region because of the presence of Iran and uh, the deal of uh, Iran and China. It will be a, it will create, uh, you can say, uh, more hostilities between. China and United States in the region of the Middle East as well. And that region will start contesting because once Iran is there uh, in the basket of China, maybe, maybe, maybe Iraq may also follow there. We never Listen, Syria yeah, I mean, this is it's a definite scenario. I mean, one thing is, is, is Israelis are not used to thinking Indo-Pacifically. Uh, it's a very important geopolitical term, as you know. Obviously, it's used throughout that region and used in the United States. It's not really a term that Israelis think of themselves as being a part of, but you're absolutely right. Israelis definitely are used to thinking of themselves as an American ally, are definitely used to thinking, at least in, in hypothetical Cold War terms, having gone through the actual Cold War on the American side and being faced with Soviet proxies and allies across our borders. Uh, but sure, this is a possible scenario. Obviously, the real world is more complicated. Israel has its own relationship with China. I myself was part of a delegation of Israeli journalists and spokespersons to China last summer. And Israel wants, an import, wants a relationship with China, just as it wants an important relationship with India. And it wants to juggle that with having, obviously, an all-important relationship with the United States. But of course, what we've seen in the last six months can't be ignored. And the hardening of that division between the US, the US and China and yes, I, I think that at least in some scenarios, this normalization is not just about Israel and the UAE. It's not even just about the Middle East. It's about this larger region. And you have even expanded the scope, not even just about the region from Corfu to the Andamans, but about a region no. from Corfu to Tasmania. And yes, it so will, it that's will. fascinating. See, oh, well, I always say uh, there is the quad. And the future is not just quad. It will be quad plus. You must be. Uh, you must have heard about quad. The, it is a military alliance, uh, unwritten military alliance between United States, India, Japan, and Australia for Indo-Pacific region to counter China. Now, if I look at Israel, I look at Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait, United Arab Emirates. They are also allies of United States. So I, I always maintain one thing that Quad will replace, uh, Quad will be a replica of NATO in Asia, especially in, Indo in Indo-Pacific region. And the expansion will take plus, you can say Quad plus will include Israel, Saudi Arabia, GCC countries. Because Listen, it's very, very interesting. I mean, again, the, the hitch to all of this is, as I mentioned, Israel wants a good relationship with China. It's very, it's important. Uh, India, for that matter, correct me if I'm wrong, it's a good relationship with Iran. Obviously not if Iran signs a, what, a $25 billion deal with China. Um, but in principle, India, Iran's an important country geopolitically for India. And India, all things being equal, wants a good relationship with Iran. So 
at this point, it's premature to divide the world into these two blocks and to set up this whole network, let alone alliance. But it's certainly, I think, something that is a, a real possible scenario if we look 10 years, 20 years out. Actually, it looks to me that uh, uh, up till uh, 2020 US presidential election, Mr. Donald Trump will take this issue between US and China to an extent of the uh, point of no return. So whoever is in the Oval Office, he has to counter China. It looks to me, uh, from what I study, that he, he will bring it to the point of no return. Be it in uh, listen, technology, obviously Benin, Donald Huawei. Trump has. Yeah. yeah, listen. Obviously, Donald Trump has taken that discussion in a certain direction. It, it had impact all over the world, including very much in Israel. I think we talked about it in our last talk, actually. Uh, Joe Biden. I think would manage that relationship differently. But listen, I, I think what we've learned in the past years is, is it's not just Trump. It's large parts of the American establishment and the American public that see this as a relationship that it, it just by its nature can't be free of some of some friction, at least. And so yeah. you're right. This looks like something that is going to be developing more. And uh, OK, just I want to divert from the topic because there are so many Jews even in United States and Jews are they're a big lobby. I'm sorry if you use that word. I don't know if I should use that word or not, but I'm using the word. The Jews are very powerful lobby in United States as uh, a generalist who covers international issues. How do you look at the prospects of uh, 2020 elections and Donald Trump? Is he winning? Well, listen, I mean, First of all, of course, you're right that, that American Jews have a lot of powerful lobbying organizations, uh, APAC being first and foremost in terms of its power yeah. and its ability to, to mobilize support. Uh, look, I, I think that, first of all, American Jews vote as Americans and have issues that are important to them individually or communally that aren't connected to foreign policy or to Israel. When we talk about Israel, the most important thing for American Jews is that support for Israel be bipartisan. And that has really been the emphasis, increasingly so over the last few years. And in that sense, I think people will be heartened by the fact that Donald Trump, of course, has a, has a strong pro-Israel record. And so does Joe Biden. And that Joe Biden's running mate, Kamala Harris, also is very connected to the community and connected to APAC and connected to these issues. So I think people are going to be very, very happy that both tickets present a pro-Israel platform and a pro-Israel orientation in foreign policy. Uh, there's obviously worry inside the American Jewish community, for that matter, here in Israel, about some currents inside the Democratic Party. They're not on the presidential ticket, uh, at least in 2020, but people, <laughs> I think, are, are worried about that in, in the medium to long-term future. And people are very, very active on that front. Uh, but there's still a lot more to be done, and I'm, I'm not sure that people's goals have have been achieved. Uh, to the contrary, people are still very, very worried. Oh, well, I feel that I should talk with you even one more hour. But uh, since I know that you have to go to your studio and you have to present about the Sudanese story. You got it. So That's right. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.